time for news and sport for the borders with David Knox. Good afternoon. A 36-year-old man who caused a disturbance outside Jedburgh Sheriff Court earlier this week has been jailed for four months. Carol Kersop from Coldstream was reported to be shouting and swearing as well as uttering threats of violence in the marketplace during Monday's court lunch break. When police arrived, he resisted arrest and obstructed them in their duty. Sheriff Kevin McCarran said he had no option but to impose a custodial sentence. Work is ongoing to recover an overturned lorry from a junction near Lauder. Both the A697 and the B6362 have been closed in both directions following the crash at around 7 o'clock this morning. Diversions remain in place and it's hoped the routes will reopen earlier this evening. NHS Borders Chief Executive Rafe Roberts is to retire this summer with his board facing its biggest financial challenge. Having worked in the NHS for close to 35 years, Mr Roberts says that he has reached the stage in life where he wants to explore new opportunities. NHS Borders is currently drawing up plans to make £27 million of savings from its operational budget for the forthcoming financial year. The board state that the recruitment process for a new chief executive has commenced. Campaigners for a national park in the Borders have submitted proposals to Holyrood ahead of tomorrow's deadline. The Scottish Government has committed to designating at least one new national park by 2026. Early expressions of interest were made by 10 community groups last year after Minister Lorna Slater announced her intention of cre- increasing Scotland's parks from the current two. Malcolm Dixon from the Campaign for a Borders National Park. We've got a very strong bid uh, which we've put together over the years uh, very enthusiastic about that. Uh, this is the first uh, time that the Scottish Government has done it this way, if you like, because the first two national parks were kind of it's a kind of top-down process. But um, all of the bids uh, this time round uh, are, are from the communities themselves, if you like. Forestry and Land Scotland has revealed that New Castleton is next in line for major development plans. With the £6 million Glentress Master Plan heading towards completion, focus is switching towards the Seven Stains Centre at New Castleton. It's hoped that improvements at the, at the base will lead to better accessibility, improved facilities and increased usage. Consultation events will take place from tomorrow until Saturday at the Buclue House. Scottish Borders Council is to look at creating five new access routes across the region. With the details, here's Luke Jarman. The council is working with sustainable transport charity Sustrans to develop an active travel strategy for the borders. Part of that will develop a network of paths which the council state will provide the maximum benefit for residents and communities. Members of the public and communities were asked at the end of last year to tell the council which routes they want to see developed, with a view to linking towns, villages and places together. The five most popular routes identified were Hoyk to Denham, Hoyk to Selkirk, Lauder to Oxton, Clovenfords to Walker Burn and Tweedbank to Eymouth. The routes will now be considered as part of a path network for walking, cycling, horse riding and wheeling. Police are appealing for help in tracing vandals who damaged the historic bridge in Kelso. Overnight on Saturday into Sunday, three ornamental lanterns on Rennie Bridge were either damaged or removed. A drain cover was also taken from the road crossing. Investigating officers want to hear from any witnesses on 101. We'll turn to sport now. Jed Forrest's time amongst the top rugby clubs in Scotland may be over at first 15 level after relegation from the Premiership. But there are signs that it could just be temporary. The Jed Jaguars Club, which involves nearly 100 boys and girls from primary 1 to 7, held a 50th anniversary dinner this month. It attracted nearly 500 people and took the year's fundraising to over £50,000. On top of the move to the new Jedburgh Grammar Campus, organiser Stephen Turbo feels there is a bright future. The mid-season drop-off, it doesn't happen anymore now, you know, because there's, we're no sitting cold in the mud at would end. And I think off the back of that, the, the skill sets have improved tenfold as well. You know, all the teams are doing phenomenally well when they do go to tournaments. And, you know, we're just a small town at the end of the day, so there must be a reason why we're doing as well. We've got 18 fantastic coaches at the minute, and, you know, along with the, the skill sets that are that improved in the 3G and... There's 96 registered kids, which is 
almost the most the clubs had. I think 101 was the highest. So getting players doing there and giving them a good experience is, is, is the key to the future, I think. In football, Gallifrey and Rovers missed out on a second semi cup semi final when they lost 3 2 to Inverkeithing Hillfield Swifts last night. Easter Scotland qualifying cup tie. In hockey, Selkirk High School are the South School's first 11 champions for this season. They edged out Galashiels Academy with a goal from Ayla Thompson to clinch the trophy. Borders weather. Here's Judith Rolston. Winds will pick up this evening ahead of a band of rain which will sweep in from the west. It'll be heavy in nature too, but the rain clears during the early hours with drier and clearer conditions developing, turning quite chilly overnight with lows of 2 to 5 Celsius, possibly even a wee touch of frost in shelter. Tomorrow, a lot of dry weather to come with some sunshine, cater for the odd shower at times blowing in from the west. It'll be breezy, but it will feel colder, highs of 8 degrees. BBC Radio Scotland's weather for the border. On digital radio, FM, your smart speaker, and on BBC Sounds, BBC Radio Scotland. Drive time with Graham Stewart this afternoon. It's 23 minutes to five. Let me bring you some breaking news. We've just received audio of the sentencing of Ian Packer at the High Court in Glasgow. Now, as we've been reporting, he was found guilty of murdering Emma Caldwell 18 years after police first identified him as a potential suspect in the case. Ian Packer strangled the 27-year-old sex worker in April 2005 and left her naked body in woods in South Lanarkshire. Well, here's what happened when he was sentenced, and the voice you'll hear is of Lord Beckett. You've been found guilty of the murder of Emma Caldwell and a large number of other very serious crimes. For murder, the sentence is fixed by law. You will be sentenced to life imprisonment. Over more than 25 years, you pursued a campaign of violence and appalling sexual mistreatment of a very large number of women. You have caused great harm to so many people as you indulged your pathologically selfish and brutal sexual desires. The women involved resisted and protested, but you would not listen. The trauma you caused has led to suffering which has endured for decades. And Lord Beckett's also paid tribute to Emma Caldwell's mother and family. Through her determined and unflinching pursuit of justice, Mrs Caldwell surely influenced the reawakening of the investigation, which has finally given her the justice she and her family sought for her daughter. Her campaigning is a living testament to her love for, and love for her daughter and the enormity of her loss. It is notable that the patient, persistent and professional police work undertaken from 2005 to 2007, exemplified by the vital work of retired detectives Stuart Hall and David Barr, has stood the test of time. Credit, too, goes to investigative journalists, notably Samantha Poling, who shone a light on your activities. So 51-year-old Ian Packer sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 36 years. Well, Magdalene Robertson was Ian Packer's first known victim. She was raped by him when she was 15 years old. She's been speaking to our home affairs correspondent, David Cowan, about the length of time it's taken to reach today's conviction. I do have mixed emotions about it because um, although he's been convicted now, um, he's had a lot of time to get away with it. He's been getting away with it for years and it's late, it's far too late for him to be charged. He should have been charged and maybe he would have saved a lot of other victims uh, suffering. Let's go back to 2006 then. The police chased you, the police approached you uh, as part of their investigation into the murder of Emma Caldwell. Police came to me and said that they had heard from other uh, witnesses or people that gave statements that I had been sexually assaulted by Ian Packer. So they asked me if I would like to press charges and give a statement. So they came to my house, we agreed a date, I gave a statement. I told them that I had been sexually assaulted from 14 and I was raped when I was 15. When the police came to see you in 2006 then, did they tell you they were investigating Emma Caldwell's murder? That's how it started. So when they came to you and told you that, what was your reaction when you heard that? First of all, I thought, <laughs> they're taking me seriously. The police actually believe me. Um, and then other witnesses had confirmed what I had said, so maybe there was some belief there. Um, and when I gave my story, it took me back to the 
the time that it all happened and I, I gave my story as truthfully and as honestly as I could and uh, yeah, it was the first time ever really reporting this. Evidence was gathered against Ian Packer, we know. They also were gathering evidence against four other men who were charged. Ian Packer wasn't charged. So you, were you aware of all that? Were you aware in 2007 of other people being charged over Emma? Yes, from the newspapers. And when you heard those charges had been dropped, what did you make of that? That when they had dropped, that the police had been pursuing the wrong people. That was evidence because I could read that. Then I was unsure what the police had and what they were doing. It all seemed quite confusing. I didn't know what they were doing. And did anything happen by 2007 about the allegations you'd made against Ian Packer? Nothing had happened at any point from... The time I reported it in 2006 until 2022 when he was charged. 16 years? Yes. Given you disclosed all this to the police in 2006 then, how did you feel about the fact that all these years had gone by without anything being done? Um, that it wasn't important. It wasn't worthwhile chasing up. It wouldn't make any difference if there was another rapist paedophile in the street. That, that same impression, um, you'd know where to turn to. When I was younger and this was happening, nobody believed me. I had nowhere to turn to. And as an adult, I reported it to the authorities and I had nowhere to turn to. And the case that's been put before the High Court is that a large number of women were attacked long after 2000, 2005. What are your thoughts on that? Some guilt that I didn't fight a bit more. You feel guilty? Yeah, because I, maybe I should have kicked up more. But you told the police. I did. And I challenged the police on this later. I should have challenged a bit more. I should have... I tried to contact MPs as well. Um, I should have done something else. Maybe... I don't know. But um, because I didn't push it as much as what I could, there, there does lay a little bit of guilt here. Right. Let's now speak uh, to Sandy Brindley of Rape Crisis Scotland. Uh, Sandy, just listening to that interview there, I was struck by the fact that Magdalene was almost blaming herself, saying, well, I wish I'd done more, I wish I'd spoken to an MSP or something. What do you make of that? Uh, I thought that was completely heartbreaking to listen to. I mean, it, it seems to me she did absolutely everything she could and the, the responsibility here is with Police Scotland, not 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 with her. I mean, in this case, I think we're seeing the devastating consequences of what it means when Police Scotland do not take women seriously or girls seriously when they report rape or sexual crime. So many women were so badly let down over those years when they did report, they did have the courage to report to the police, which is not easy to, to do. I heard Magdalene saying there just about that, that hope that somebody might believe her. It takes a lot of courage to take that hope that somebody will believe you and to speak to the police about something like this and to not be believed, I think, is devastating individually, but also the consequences in terms of perpetrators being free to continue to attack again and again, I, I think really is devastating. Let's talk about why it was the case that they weren't believed. Is it simply because these women were sex workers? I mean, it, is, it's, it certainly is hard to take any other interpretation here. I mean, for a significant number of women to report and not to be listened to. Um, but we, we also saw something similar with the John Warboy's case um, down south, the taxi driver, where many, many, many women reported him. But I think often... Um, if women are perceived as not being credible for a, a whole range of reasons, that may be because they've been intoxicated, it may be because they're involved in selling sex, it might be for a whole number of other reasons, but I, I think this case really does bring home the consequences of that kind of value judgment being made by the police. I mean, in fairness, I, I, I would say there have been huge changes to how the police respond to sexual crime in Scotland over the past 10, 15 years. But that doesn't in any way take away from the devastation for those women that did have the courage to report Ian Parker, only to see nothing happening. Yeah, the thing is, 2005 wasn't that long ago, but it does sound like the, the culture in the police, as you suggest in your answer there, was completely different. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's, I mean, it is, it is a scandal. Like, it is absolutely shocking what what happened in this case. And I would like to pay tribute both to Emma's family, but also to the women who gave, who, who were still alive to give evidence. I mean, some women died and couldn't give evidence, but for the women who were able to go through these, uh, the, this trial after so, so many years and give evidence in an effort to see in Parker face justice. I think that took a lot of courage and I really, really want to pay tribute to them for, for doing that. It isn't just about the length of time. It isn't just about the fact that justice was delayed, justice was denied. That length of time, that wait, that almost 20 year wait, actually led to more women being attacked. Yeah, that, that this is the consequences of what, what it means when the justice system fails to respond adequately and appropriately to complaints of rape is that perpetrators are free to continue to carry out these crimes. I mean, that, 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 that there is no doubt in my mind that, that, that there are a significant number of women who would not have had to go through the trauma of what they went through if the police had behaved as they should have to these initial reports against Dean Parker. And that, that really is what, what, what one of the many tragedies of this case. So Ian Parker will be jailed for at least 36 years. Is that a fair and right sentence in your view? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's not for, for me to comment on that. I, I, I think that's, that's really for, for Emma's It's family, just sometimes in the past, as you, as you yeah. know, the sentence is handed down. A lot of people have said, well, that's not long yeah. enough. It's, it's a substa- it is a very substantial uh, sentence. And I listened to Lord Beckett's sentence and re- remarks, and I, I thought they were, they were very thoughtful. And it was very, very much, I, I think, acknowledging the harm caused by Ian Parker to, to so many women, um, Emma's family, but also to the many, many women that he, he brutalised and that he raped or sexually assaulted. And I, th- I think it is appropriate that that harm is recognised and that he receives a very, very substantial sentence, which I, I think this is. As you know more than most people, very few rape and sexual assault cases end in guilty verdicts. Does this verdict make that more or less likely to happen in future? I mean, I, 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 I think that, that this case really kind of t- t- tells two stories. Like, what, one is a story of police failure to take rape seriously and the terrible consequences of that. But I mean, what 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 I also hope is that it tells a story of change where the the, the, the police have I I hope and it does it does seem to be have really taken the learnings and the failures of that very very seriously and that we we, we now have what what seems to me to have been a really strong case that has resulted in a conviction a, a huge number of charges and a very substantial sentence so I I, I would certainly hope that for the the women who had the, the, the courage to report all those years ago, I would hope what, what they would take away from this is not that in any way they were at fault, because it, it seems to me they did absolutely everything they could. It was the system that let them down. I, I hope they will take some comfort from the fact that the system now in 2024 has actually taken them very, very seriously and recognised the harm that was caused to them. So how important do you think that fulsome apology from Police Scotland has been? I think it was absolutely crucial. I think the only thing that Police Scotland could do or can do in these circumstances is recognise the the complete failure to respond in in any way appropriately to women disclosing rape. I mean, rape rape is such a serious crime for for Police Scotland or police officers to hear and to receive reports of rape and to not act on it is is absolutely astonishing. And I I think the police have recognised that these women and girls were let down and I think they're absolutely right to have done so. Okay, Sandy Brindley from Rape Crisis Scotland, thank you very much indeed for speaking to us. And you can watch Catching a Killer, the murder of Emma Caldwell on BBC iPlayer right now. And it will also be shown on uh, BBC One Scotland tonight at nine o'clock. And uh, it's on BBC Scotland rather. And later on BBC One Scotland at five to twelve. And you can also listen to the podcast series Who Killed Emma on BBC Sounds. Now, debate night is back on BBC Scotland this evening. Stephen Jardin is here to tell us more. Stephen, what are you talking about? 
Well, special occasion tonight, actually, Graham. We launched debate night five years ago this week, and since then we've been through Brexit, the pandemic, cost of living crisis, domestic political problems, war in Ukraine, and upheavals in the Middle East as well. And we've travelled the country, thousands of audience members and hundreds of panellists too. Tonight we're in Dundee. On the panel with me this evening, from the SNP, Michelle Thompson, MSP. From Scottish Labour, Michael Mara, MSP. From the Scottish Conservatives, Douglas Lumsden, MSP, and our non-politicians on the panel this evening, very interesting, entrepreneur and businessman Callie Russell, the only person to have been on Dragon's Den twice and turned down the Dragons when he was offered investment on both occasions, and Cumnock-born author Emma Christie, whose new book is The Times, Thriller of the Month right now, from Westminster Hot to Holyrood and beyond. We've got a lot to talk about this evening, so make sure you join us. Debate night, 10.30 this evening from Dundee on the BBC Scotland channel, or any time after that on the BBC iPlayer. And happy birthday to you and the team, Stephen. You haven't aged a bit in those five years, I'm happy to say. <laughs> right, let's get on with the sport now. It's a busy evening, Gavin Moss. It is indeed, Graham. You've just saved your bacon there to get a night on debate night with that end <laughs> one there, so good luck to you. Yeah, our main focus on sports sound from six is the Edinburgh Derby at Tynecastle as Hearts will look to get not just the bragging rights, but quickly get over the 5-0 drubbing at Ibrox at the weekend. The Tynecastle side last defeat was against Rangers in the last round of fixtures and manager Stephen Naismith says tonight's game is ideal to get over that result Positive is you've got a game so quickly after a defeat to get back on a, a winning feeling and, and hopefully start another good run is what, what we've done with it being a derby it'll be a good game I think the, the two derbies so far have been open the last one probably lacked a bit of quality but overall they've been entertaining games Hibbs' last league win was against Livingston in December, that was December the 9th, and lost the previous derby 1-0 at Easter Road during the festive period. Manager Nick Montgomery, though, admits the late defeat to Hearts was hard to take, but tonight is a chance to rectify that. We lost it later on in the last minute of injury time to one moment of quality from the most uh, prolific striker in the league this season. So that's something that we have to be wary of, but we create a lot of chances and we know that we have to be uh, you know, more, more ruthless in, in them chances. And yeah, we'll, we'll take a lot of confidence into the game. Obviously an opportunity for us to, to keep building some momentum. Nick Montgomery is also set to benefit from a sizable amount to spend on transfers after the deal for Bournemouth majority shareholder Bill Foley's £6 million investment was ratified at the club's AGM last night. Our reporter Brian McLaughlin can shed a bit more light on it for us. Around about one and a half to two million pounds will be added to the player budget this summer. Um, now, most of the money will be going on uh, adding to the existing infrastructure at Hibs, the, the hospitality areas. Now, one of Ron Gordon's uh, wishes was to improve the match, the experiences for Hibs fans. Now, anybody who's been to the main stand at Easter Road recently will have seen that that has certainly happened. There are plans to expand it into the, the North Stand, the famous Five Stand. So that will be one part of where some of the money is going. Also down to HTC, the Hibernian Training Centre outside Trinent. There's plans there to expand the indoor facility there to improve the floodlighting on other pitches and also for the women's game to make there a permanent home for the Hibernian's women team down at Easter Road. So a lot of the money will be used to help the existing structure there. Mm -hmm. But the fans, as we all know, want to see one thing. They want to turn up on a Saturday afternoon and see their team win. Elsewhere, champions Celtic are playing catch-up at the top of the league as they host Dundee. League leaders Rangers take the short journey down the M77 to Kilmarnock, a place that hasn't been a happy hunting ground over the last few seasons. Philippe Clement sides at two points ahead of Celtic at the summit, but while Rangers lost their season opener in Ayrshire this term, the manager tells us his Rangers side are nothing like the team they were then. It's a totally different story. There were other ideas, other players also. A lot of things have changed, so I don't think you need to put a lot of emphasis on that. So we're going to go there full focus, but we know it's one of those uh, dangerous moments that it can be a bump on the road. Elsewhere, Livingston hopes Motherwell, Aberdeen face St Johnston, and with the Dawes 100% in a relegation battle. Those are the words of the former Scotland midfielder Kevin Thompson, who's a guest on the Scottish Football Daily podcast, available now on BBC Sounds. Sports Sound is live coverage of all the build-up here from six tonight on Radio Scotland. Andy Murray says he'd like the chance to compete at this summer's Olympics, but has outlined the timetable for his retirement and finally been explicit on when to expect it. 
I'm likely not going to play past the summer. Um, you know, I get asked about it after every single match that I play, every single tournament that I play. Um, and it's a bit, I'm, I'm bored of the question, um, to, to be honest. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm not going to talk more about that um, between now and whenever the, the time comes for me to stop. But yeah, I don't plan on playing much past the summer. Andy Murray went out of the Dubai Tennis Championships to the French five-seed uh, Hugo Humbert earlier on. Formula One quickly in Red Bull team principal Christian Horner has been cleared of inappropriate behaviour towards a female colleague following an internal investigation. And Graham, don't forget, Sports Sound is on the air from 6 o'clock tonight. There's live commentary from Rugby Park, Tyne Castle, and online commentary of Celtic versus Dundee. That is your sports, son. We will not forget, Gavin. Certainly not. Thanks very much indeed for that. Now, Prince Harry has lost a high court challenge against the government over the level of his security protection when he's in the UK. The Duke of Sussex had been trying to overturn a ruling which saw his security status downgraded after he stopped being a working royal. I've been speaking to the BBC's Sean Dilley who's been covering the story. Yeah, it's a really good question because people always hear about Prince Harry or someone else in the high court. It has been Prince Harry in different cases, but this one is uh, a judicial review. A judicial review is something that people can uh, challenge, something where people can challenge a decision they don't like normally made by a government body or, you know, quasi uh, body. And in this case, the decision was to remove his routine armed police uh, support. Now, let, let's, let's just be really clear. They didn't say they wouldn't offer him armed police support. What they've effectively done, and I've spoken to um, a former VIP protection officer with very recent knowledge, uh, who's actually worked with Harry, he's worked with other royals, um, they've essentially downgraded his royal status. So in this case, the court has said, well, no, hang on a minute, they've made the decision and their rationale was not unlawful and it wasn't wrong. So just explain to us some of the arguments that were put forward in court and, and what exactly happened. Arguments put forward in court uh, on the government side were that they would do this routinely. Uh, the reason that Prince Harry had that full-time support was because of his position as a senior working royal. All of a sudden, he's not a senior working royal and he's not even in the UK very much. Whether people know this or not, it doesn't matter where you're listening to this now. So, for example, if you get royalty protection, um, you know, we could say Glasgow, we could talk up in Orkney if we want. If you're in Kirkwall and there's a royal there, they're going to have a metropolitan police close protection team with them. And they'll work with Police Scotland, for example, and that's the case wherever people go in the world. It becomes slightly harder when somebody initially in 2020 kind of moved to Canada initially and then obviously into the United States. And Harry's been forced to use private security. Now, that what private security can't do in the UK, of course, is carry firearms. What private security hasn't got access to is intelligence on specific threats. However, again, the government's argument is that if there's a threat, they'll be aware, they'll deal with it. The key argument from Harry's lawyer, or one key argument, is that they're saying he was being treated less favourably than other royals and other people because there were senior members of the royal household on the RAVIC committee that decides on this close protection for royals and public figures uh, at a time when there were some very serious tensions between Harry, uh, the Duke of Sussex, and uh, senior members of the royal family. So, Sean, where do things go from here? Prince Harry has said he'll appeal, but look, let's be clear, uh, what that means is Prince Harry will seek to appeal. He'll certainly have the best lawyers uh, going, and if it's possible, but you can't just appeal a court decision because you don't like the result. You have to have legal grounds, and ordinarily that would be that there was an error made in law. Uh, as we know, listening here uh, in Scotland, the law in England and Wales is, 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 is different, but the same principle. Ultimately, you still have to have grounds for an appeal. That's the BBC's Sean Dilley reporting there on Prince Harry, who's lost a High Court challenge against the government over the level of his security protection when he's in the UK. You're listening to Drive Time on BBC Radio Scotland with Graham Stewart. It's just coming up to five o'clock. And Scotland's worst sex offender is jailed for at least 36 years for murder. Ian Packer has also been found guilty of 33 physical and sexual violence charges against 22 women. But why did it take police?
least two decades to bring him to justice. I'll be speaking to the lawyer representing Emma Caldwell's family, Amar Anwar, and asking him why they've had to wait so long for justice. Separately, we'll also be looking at the way Scotland might be policed in the future. All that's still to come, but first, the latest BBC News from Nina Latsuri. The killer of Emma Caldwell has been sentenced to life behind bars with a minimum term of 36 years. Ian Packer was convicted of murdering Ms Caldwell and dumping her body in Woodland in South Lanarkshire in 2005. 51-year-old Packer was also found guilty of multiple rapes and sexual assaults against a total of 22 women. Sentencing at the